My name is Anthony Gazazis. I'm the director of the NYC Real Estate Expo, as well as the NYC Network Group. And I want to welcome you all and thank you all for registering for today's webinar. It's Alternative and Niche Residential Commercial Mortgage Programs from Immigrant Funding Corporation. Um, our sponsor today is Immigrant Funding Corporation. Immigrant Funding Corporation is a subsidiary of Immigrant Bank. Immigrant Bank was founded in 1850 and is the oldest savings bank in New York City. In addition, it is one of the largest privately owned banks in the country. Immigrant Bank has three divisions that focus on providing real estate lending, Immigrant Realty Finance, Immigrant Mortgage Company, and Immigrant Funding Corporation. Today's webinar is centered on Immigrant Funding Corporation, which is a small balanced commercial lending arm of Immigrant Bank. Immigrant Funding is a direct portfolio lender specializing in first mortgage financing and most types of investor owner um, owned and owner occupied commercial real estate. Um, our special guest today is Charles Ruffin. Charles Ruffin is a AVP and sales manager at Immigrant Funding. His primary role at Immigrant is to originate SBA multifamily mixed use office retail warehouse underlining co-op and SRO loans. He also originates residential loans. Before joining Immigrant, uh, Charles worked for companies such as Davenport Capital and J.P. Morgan Chase and has amassed over 22 years of experience. He holds a JD and an MBA and a New York real estate broker's license. Building upon Immigrant's introductory webinar, Charles Ruffin will provide an overview of the unique and creative residential mortgage products that Immigrant offers. Charles will also provide comprehensive information regarding Immigrant's new and better priced select commercial mortgage programs. Today's programs discussions will be jumbo loans up to 10 million, jumbo loans, um, yeah, jumbo loans up to 10 million, cash flow programs for investment properties, blanket loans, detail regarding Immigrant's new select commercial mortgage programs and pricing. And afterwards, we'll finish up with Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Charles Ruffin. Hey, thanks a lot, Anthony. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, so Anthony gave a great introduction as far as uh, the bank itself. Um, the oldest privately owned bank here <clears throat> in New York City and within the top five largest privately owned banks in the United States. So uh, what we're going to do is briefly go over at least the three lending divisions of the bank, but we're going to spend more time dealing with Immigrant Mortgage Corporation. That's where we have our business purpose loan cash flow program. And we're going to also go back over uh, our program dealing with Immigrant Funding Corporation. That's our small balance lending program. But to start off, we'll at least talk about Immigrant Realty Finance. That's our large balance commercial lending division. So this platform is basically a nationwide bridge loan platform, looks for deals 15 million and above, and typically it's LIBOR-based financing and the type of clients we usually deal with, equity, mezzanine and debt funds, real estate developers, real estate operators, public REITs and private REITs. So it's a much higher criteria to get into the door with this type of uh, lending platform. But if you have a client that fits that criteria, great rates, LIBOR rates, bridge financing, which is more or less short-term financing. So as Anthony mentioned, Immigrant Funding Corporation, overall, that's our small balance lending division. Typically, we look at a bunch of, I would say, 70% multifamily mixed-use property. So what we're going to lend on, the remaining 30% urban office, urban retail, commercial condo, commercial co-op financing as well, too. And this is a niche platform. So what makes this different from a lot of other lenders is... <clears throat> typically most lenders will look at more or less kind of plain vanilla scenarios. They want borrowers, great credit, great purpose financial statement, great PFS and a boatload of properties to land in their lap for future financing. So the owner of the bank created a platform for those type of scenarios that might not fit that criteria. So this platform is for niche financing and we're gonna go over that in detail. 
So dealing with the highlights for Immigrant Funding Corporation. So as far as these days, maximum leverage is typically 60% and that's for a purchase. I have seen us go around 60% for a rate and term request, depending on you know, what the hair on the deal is. But overall, that 60% is typically just for a purchase request. As far as broker fee, we will protect brokers. We're really broker friendly. So whatever you're charging, as long as you have a signed fee agreement, we'll collect that for you at closing. We also will pay a broker a 1% yield spread premium that comes from immigrant because we know a lot of these transactions in which you know regular plain vanilla banks have passed on, they require additional work. So we understand that. So we are broker friendly with this 1% yield spread premium paid to brokers. Immigrant overall, we don't charge any points or any application fees. And also we're not a relationship lender. So I deal with a lot of other colleagues at different banks in which maybe the scenario doesn't work well for that bank and that client still needs financing. So we'll provide the financing, but we won't require that client to move their relationship, meaning any stocks or bonds, any type of assets that that other colleague at another bank, uh, you know, basically they need, you know, for their own particular bank. So we won't require that particular relationship, not a relationship lender. As far as feedback, uh, quick feedback, we have a flat hierarchy. So typically if I have a scenario, and dealing with the broker request or something of that nature, usually within the same day, uh, I can at least give some feedback verbally. And if it's more or less you know, um, positive, then we'll gather the additional information as far as what we'll need to analyze it, do a credit write up to issue a term sheet. Term sheet usually can be given within like 24 to 48 hours once we have all the information on what we're looking for initially. As far as no seasoning requirement, what that basically means is sometimes, you know, a client borrower or a broker bringing a deal, the client purchases a property all cash. Uh, maybe it's delivered vacant, for example. So we don't require that particular uh, borrower to have it fully occupied for say 12 or 24 months before we can say give them perm financing or pull cash out. So there's no seasoning requirement there. We also don't have any cash out restrictions. Some of my colleagues at different institutions, they right now, they're not providing any cash out. They're pretty much doing rate and terms or purchase requests, but we don't have any cash out restrictions as long as the numbers work as far as debt service coverage, you're fine. On a purchase request, since we aren't a highly leveraged lender, since we look at deals with <clears throat> various types of issues, um, sometimes the borrower might not have all the equity needed. So we will allow a seller to hold a second mortgage and we'll underwrite that using a cumulative debt service coverage with our mortgage to say, if we go back to a 50%, we'll allow that seller to hold paper, maybe up to 75, 80% overall. And we'll underwrite that particular second mortgage along with our first. So overall, we're looking still at a 1.15 debt service coverage when we underwrite. We do have a line of credit program, which is kind of unique. A lot of uh, institutions just have that on the residential side. So we will have, we do have a line of credit program works similar to a residential line of credit in which the individual can draw down on it. Immigrant would never be in a second position on the line of credit behind another lender. So it would either be a line of credit in first position or we might have term debt in the first position, just say like five year fix, and then the client can have a line of credit behind that particular first position. Also what makes this division really unique, uh, we could underwrite using market rent. A lot of lenders are cash flow lenders. So if you have a couple of vacancies or maybe, maybe even a owner occupied unit, they won't necessarily count that particular unit when they're underwriting it, but we can use market rent. So if there's uh, any vacant units, <clears throat> we can underwrite it using the market rent or if it's an owner occupied unit that could be on the commercial or the residential portion of the property itself, we could use market rent for that just to underwrite it. We do provide blanket loans. So what a blanket loan is, so just say for example, uh, someone's buying an apartment building, for example, and my leverage 60% isn't high enough, but they own some mixed use properties or even residential properties with no debt or little debt. 
I can use that additional collateral along with the property that they're purchasing and theoretically give 100% financing with no cash coming from the bar or having to liquidate anything out of savings and use the equity within the other real estate that's added and that's a blanket loan. And that also works on a refinance request. So just say if I'm at a 50 LTV, and that's pretty much where we're at these days for a refi cash out and the leverage doesn't work, the borrower has additional collateral. I can always add additional collateral to make the deal work. So dealing with vacant buildings, we, you know, we can't finance them as well. It has to be in decent condition. Immigrant, at least in this division, we don't provide financing to properties that need a lot of rehab work. So my other division, large balance, that's what their program is for, bridge loans. But here we get finance properties that are delivered vacant, but it pretty much has to be in decent condition. It doesn't have to be perfect. It may need some general upgrades, but overall we want properties that are in decent condition and the issue of it being vacant isn't a deal killer. This division, no minimum credit score. I've done deals with borrowers with credit scores in the 500s. Now, uh, when you have someone with impaired credit, you know, we have to agree with, you know, the issue of why they have the impaired credit. But if it's understandable and it makes sense, we can lend. Of course, you're going to have a lower LTV and probably a higher, not even probably, you will have a higher rate than someone who has a higher credit score. But again, we will look at the bigger picture. That's what the owner of the bank created this lending platform for, to look at the bigger picture. As far as liquidity minimum, certain types of entities, they require a certain percentage of liquidity, meaning cash, stocks, bonds, savings, that the borrower should have in order to receive financing. We deal with a lot of real estate investors and a lot of them, you know, they have, you know, uh, their liquidity in real estate. So that's not a deal killer for us. If the borrower doesn't have too much liquidity, we're looking at the bigger picture again. As far as flexibility, you know, borrowers with a past bankruptcy or foreclosure, you might have had a short sale. Again, we're going to look at the overall, you know, scenario to see if we feel comfortable with it and then provide financing. Owner-occupied properties, like I mentioned, commercial condo, commercial co-ops, owner-occupied, or like I mentioned, even mixed-use properties. So again, we're going to underwrite using market rent. And this is applicable because certain times you might have business owners who don't show a lot on their tax returns. So you know, even though they might have a great personal financial statement, uh, certain lenders, they underwrite just off of tax returns. Here, we could use the market rent, and as long as that works, that's another way of getting a deal to the finish line. As far as rates for this particular uh, lending platform, it's typically these days for like a you know five year you know, like a five year term, we're up at the upper threes, and that's typically for multifamily and mixed use properties. Once you go to office retail, you're a little bit higher, so theoretically, you can go anywhere from the upper threes to mid fours, depending on the property type, leverage, and things of that nature. So regarding our new platform, so I gave you a good idea with the last slide as far as rates. So what we have now is a new platform of lending, dealing with uh, scenarios that don't have as much hair as we typically would or problematic deals. So overall, <clears throat> it's called the Select Program. And that's typically either a three or five year balloon for multifamily or mixed use only. So you're not looking at commercial condo, co-op, office, retail. Minimum credit score, 700, full documentation required. Um, as far as just like it states here, no material deferred maintenance. So we want properties in a, a good condition, no real major issues and uh, no material multiple violations. Like in New York City, you have you know, HPD violations or DOB or ECDB. So we don't want a property has a lot of violations as well too. But with that, you'll see how our pricing is reflecting of that. So with the three-year program, uh, it's basically the uh, term, you can have a three plus three plus three with a 30 year amortization. So the starting rate for this platform is three and a quarter. Maximum loan amount, 5 million. Um, technically, we can go up to 10 million in this division, but that requires a higher level of approval. 
As far as a leverage, 60% uh, for a purchase, 55% give or take for a rate and term, and 50% for cash out. Debt service coverage, 1.15. Prepayment penalty, 531. Amortization, 30 years. And again, like with all of our term products, we don't charge any points, no application fees, and we will pay the yield spread premium to the broker intermediary. So with the five-year program, similar, uh, you can have also like the five plus five plus five, 30-year amortization. Best rate is 3.75. Again, maximum loan size, 5 million, but can go up to 10. Leverage again, 60% purchase, 55% rate and term, 50% cash out, debt service coverage, 1.15. And you'll see here what's a little bit different, just dealing with the prepayment penalty, 54321. Amortization, 30 years. And again, you know, no bank points or application fees, and also the 1% yield spread to the broker as well. So uh, this slide is great because it gives you a good idea of what it'll take to get a deal to the finish line with immigrant. So overall, um, it's, as far as this particular division, not looking at select. So we're talking about deals with some type of issues that have been passed on by, by other banks. So there, there's some reason why they're coming to immigrant. So they're not gonna come to immigrant uh, typically for the lowest rate or the highest LTV. So with our standard program, that's typically, you know, they're not coming for that. They have a, scenario in which they need creative underwriting to look at the bigger picture. So first, is it a property type that we finance? So like I mentioned, usually I would say 70% of on, in the commercial division here, what we're gonna finance, apartment buildings and mixed use properties. The remaining 30% urban office, urban retail, commercial condo, commercial co-op. We will look at SROs, underlying co-op financing, and occasionally condo act financing as well, depending on the scenario. But the bulk of what we lend on is multifamily and mixed use properties. Time frame for closing, uh, typically seven to eight weeks, but you can add a couple of weeks, you know, just because of people working remotely, but that's kind of the average time frame. And that's assuming, you know, no major issues pops up dealing with title or any environmental issues. As far as the next criteria, personal guarantee. Uh, usually this isn't an issue um, with individuals coming into this division because they've already been passed on by the banks that will require a personal guarantee. So they uh, feel comfortable because with our rates here, you know, um, even with deals with some type of issues, um, the rate isn't too bad as far as upper threes, more or less the low fours. Uh, leverage. Leverage is probably one of the biggest reasons why, you know, um, deals might not go forward. Because again, my leverage on a purchase, 60%, and a rate and term, you're typically 50, 55%. A lot of deals I see at times from brokers, intermediaries, they need higher leverage and they might not have the additional collateral or they might not want to pledge the additional collateral. But that's uh, one area that has to be kept in mind. And just dealing with the lending territory, you know, um, typically we're a tri-state lender. And what that means for immigrant in New York, Westchester County, typically around 287, which is around White Plains and South. So that's the five boroughs, Long Island, all of New Jersey, Southern Connecticut, which is pretty much Fairfield County. And we will look at deals in the Metro Boston area and Southeast and Southwest Florida. But overall, where the comfort level is, is typically you know, in the tri-state lending territory. That's the bulk, I would say, where we lend and comfort area. So now we're gonna go into you know, the discussion dealing with immigrant mortgage company. So immigrant mortgage company, it's a residential division of the bank. Typically that's handling one to four family, condo, co-op, loan requests. And we have the standard agency platform, Freddie, Fannie, and some entities have the uh, Sony made platform as well, which you have like the 30 year fixed rate in the two. So a lot of banks have that platform. But so what we're gonna discuss is our portfolio program, which is different from most other institutions. So the same type of you know uh, criteria looking 
you know, um, beyond the standard, like we have an immigrant funding corporation, we have this an immigrant mortgage corporation dealing with our portfolio program. So some of the highlights, like Anthony mentioned, uh, uh, loans up to $10 million for owner occupied or investment properties. Loans can be held in corporate title or partnerships. And we're really gonna go into detail with a cash flow program. So that's for investment properties only. And what that means is we don't require tax returns, bank statements, verifications of deposit, verification of employment. So really it's a business purpose loan um, for residential properties, one to four family condos. We have done them also on co-ops. Um, but in general, that's what we're gonna discuss in greater detail. Also with the portfolio uh, platform, we will look at blanket loans available. So just say certain borrowers might have several different properties want one loan on it. So we do a lot of blanket loans. As far as the term, so it's a, either a 2-1, 5-1 or a 7-1 arm based upon a 30 year amortization period. So as far as the lending territory for the portfolio program, which is different than the agency platform, the agency platform, we can go further as far as within our uh, lending territory, but just so you know, since we're talking about portfolio here, as far as New York, we have listed here where our core lending territory is, New Jersey, the counties there and Fairfield County as well. So dealing with the um, niche program. So we did mention this as far as 10 million blanket loans. We don't have any cash out limitations. So I know some of my colleagues at other institutions on the residential side, they aren't giving cash out or they might restrict the cash out that your client is looking for financing. So we, as long as it meets our underwriting criteria uh, for this particular program, the cash flow program, we don't have any restrictions. So further detail dealing with the cash flow program. So it's a business purpose loan. So as far as the use of the cash out, for example, or even if it's a purchase, is if it's for a purchase, it's for investment properties only. Can't use it for being owner occupied. If it's for cash out, that cash out must be for going towards some type of business purpose, maybe to buy other investment real estate or to go into a business or something of that nature. So that's the, the purpose of it. It's not for uh, residential owner occupied use or for the cash out to be used for residential purposes. Title, the title must be held in an LLC or partnership corporation. And it's similar here as far as applicant is entity. So as far as the guarantors, uh, I mentioned here what we require, 25% uh, interest and that individual will be giving a PG. Uh, declaration of intent to proceed, that's just basically dealing with the paperwork that we'll have moving forward. Uh, source of income and repayment. So this goes into basically how we underwrite the file. And we're gonna go into an example after this slide more specifically, but how we underwrite it, we're basically gonna use 75% of the rent that's in place, or if it's vacant, meaning any of the units, we can use market rent. So if it's for a commercial condo or co-op, basically we're gonna use 90% of the rent. And for you know, our New York City lending territory, there's an additional type of underwriting criteria we're gonna go into more detail next, but in general, that's what we're using to calculate um, when we look at underwriting the file. As far as leverage, <clears throat> Typically on a purchase these days is 60, rate and term 55, cash out 50%. But what I've seen somewhat, you know, depending on how, you know, the underwriter feels about the deal, 55% on a purchase, rate and term 50, cash out in that 50-ish range ballpark. And when we look at cash out, so <clears throat> the requirement isn't about necessarily the dollar amount, but it looks at like the leverage. So if the cash out is $250,000 or greater, you're basically looking at you know, a lower LTV like 45%. The cash out is less than 250,000 at a 50% LTV. So pricing, that's basically on our uh, rate sheet, but just to let you know ballpark, we're around 4.625 on a 5-1 arm today, assuming you know decent credit, and about 4 and 3 eighths on a 2-1 arm, just so you know. 
As far as credit, minimum credit score is 660. And, you know, like it mentions here, dealing with mortgage rates, um, no more than two times 30. But overall, we'll, again, we'll look at the bigger picture. So I have, you know, spoken with underwriters and deals that were below 660 and, you know, had maybe mortgage issues or something of that nature. If the deal makes sense and the reason why they're below 660 makes sense, we could typically give an exception overall. We're, you know, common sense lenders. So as far as closing, you know, typically we'll be represented with the uh, borrower's council at closing in general. So overall, this kind of gives you a, a great idea of our cash flow lending program. And the big highlights, again, you know, just dealing with the lack of documentation, but we will underwrite it and we're going to go over that next. But again, no tax returns, no bank statements, verification of deposits, verification of employment. That's pretty much more or less the highlights of it. And I know our leverage isn't as high as other entities in the market that have similar products, but usually our rate would, would be better than theirs. Because typically what I've seen from competitors that have similar products, their rate typically could be in the upper five or the sixes or the sevens versus our rate uh, basically in the four. So that's where you would have to keep in mind, hey, is this an immigrant deal? You know, Just based on these particular factors overall. Now, a good scenario as far as how we would underwrite this loan request, a loan request, for example. So say, for example, we have a four family. It's a purchase request for $4 million. And this is in hypothetically Brooklyn. It could be in any of the boroughs, but say, for example, leverage, again, 60%, you know, is maximum. So the loan request basically would be for $2,400,000. And just say if this for families to live or vacant, which is fine. We're gonna use market rent. So that's where you come up with 16,000 for market rent. Now, if you look at the monthly taxes, 1,000 monthly insurance, for example, 550. So scenarios in which are in the five boroughs, this is how it's calculated. We're basically gonna look at the 16,000 as far as market rent or rent in general. We're gonna deduct 5% from that. So 15,200, and then that's where we're gonna look at the 75% uh, of that. So that's where you come up with the 11,400. So what this means is your mortgage payment you're requesting, taxes, overall and insurance should not be greater than 11,400. So let's go into the numbers dealing with what we have here with this $2,400,000 loan request. So again, monthly taxes and insurance, you come up to 1550. So just say uh, the rate is 4.75 on our 5-1 arm. And oh, just dealing with prepayment penalties, the cash flow program does have a prepayment penalty of three, two, one. So after the third year, there's no prepayment penalty and it's a 30 year loan overall. So if we look at the uh, $2,400,000 request, uh, the principal and interest payment is $12,519, which is higher than our 75% or 11,400 requirement. So what do you gotta do there? You have to reduce your loan amount until you get to a number that your principal interest tax and insurance fits the criteria of 11,400, either at that specific number or it would be less. So let's use a number for a new loan amount, 1,825,000 with a principal and interest payment of 9,520. So when you add that with your uh, taxes and insurance, you're at 11,070. So bingo, we hit the number, we are below 11,400. Now with this cash flow requirement, because <clears throat> we're in a time of COVID, we do have a 12 month uh, pity holdback. So what happens there is we're going to, from the closing, uh, that could be either a refinance or a purchase, we're going to hold back 12 months of pity, but we're not just holding that and then the bar is making the mortgage payment. What will happen is it'll be held, but the first 12 months of mortgage payments will be deducted from the pity holdback. Also dealing with a refinance request, cash out, for example, we typically wanna see at least two months of rent payments from the current tenants. 
And usually that's by bank statements, uh, usually, or maybe canceled checks or something of that nature, if applicable. But um, we want to make sure that the tenants we have in place that are in place is up to date, or at least paying rent currently. Now, as far as with brokers, the maximum you can charge dealing with the cash flow program is two points, and we'll collect that for you. So this really gives you like the fundamental idea of how the cash flow program works. And a good thing here as well, too. So even dealing with the leverage, let's say if it's 60 percent and the bar doesn't have the 40 percent to come down with, therefore, you can use our blanket loan scenario. So just say if they have another investment property, uh, one to four family condo, for example, you can add that with your purchase requests. And that'll make up your 40% as far as your equity injection plus closing costs. So that's another way of kind of getting around our particular lower leverage. Because like I mentioned, I know uh, there are other programs out there with higher leverage, but they won't beat our rate typically. But as far as how you can make the deal work with immigrant, adding additional collateral, uh, you can't lose with immigrant doing that. It opens up a lot of flexibility as far as the underwriters feeling comfortable with the deal and things of that nature. So the next slide basically just deals with license or no license. So if we look at Immigrant Funding Corporation, no license required, commercial transactions, you know, you have your broker fee agreement, that's pretty much it, and we'll collect your fee at closing. Dealing with the residential side of immigrants is a little bit different. So as you know, if it's a, a Fannie Freddie type of product, you have to have your NMLS license you know, I, like I mentioned, we do have that platform and those individuals who, you know, want to use that platform, that's a requirement. Dealing with the cash flow program, there is a licensing requirement. It's not that hard to meet, but there is something in which the uh, broker intermediary would have to fulfill in order to submit loan requests. And I know most other banks do not require any type of license for a business purpose loan. Immigrant is very unique on this. I've been debating this back and forth, you know, for years now, but it is what it is. And that's typically the requirement. But if you do have a scenario and you don't necessarily, you're not familiar with this particular requirement, we'll go over it in detail. It's not too onerous, but we do. I just want to let you know regarding, you know, uh, submission process. That's one big portion of it right there. So we've come to a close of our of the presentation, and this is my contact information here. As far as the, you know, you would like to reach me regarding different loan requests, um, and you know, just briefly regarding our next panel, which would be in February. What I want to do is put together some of my contacts at uh, other institutions in which, you know, no institution does exactly the same thing. So I want a broader array of other types of niche lenders in which can benefit the broker intermediary or even borrowers directly regarding seeing what's out there. Because right now on the residential side, the market is very fluid. A lot of different entities that closed down in March, they're back, they're lending all type of different programs. Commercial is totally different. A lot of banks have pulled back. They're either not lending or lending to their you know, best clients. And there's a totally uh, different type of um, you know, market compared to commercial and residential. So I wanna put something together that can be a benefit overall to helping the broker community uh, be able to close deals in which they need some type of creative of niche financing. And thanks again for everyone for attending. Back to you, Anthony. Hey, thank you, Charles. Uh, very, uh, very informative. And uh, we, we learned a lot about immigrant and um, it's a, a good a good programs that you have there. Very interesting. One of our uh, attendees here, Carl, uh, would you do a four unit property in Brooklyn where the fourth unit is a restaurant owned by the property owner? Sure, so that would be in our commercial division. <clears throat> mixed use property and, you know, that type of scenario, you know, rates, it, it depends on, you know, the criteria, but it could either fall into the select criteria, you know, rates as low as three and a quarter or 3.75, or to say this some type of hair on the deal, more or less, you would fall into our standard program rate starting off in around 3.99% on a five 
plus five program, but sure, we do a lot. Like I mentioned on the commercial side, 70% of what we're gonna finance is mixed use in an apartment building. So that would be fine. That's great, great. Guys, if you have any questions, please submit them in. I do have about four or five questions here of uh, attendees that were not able to uh, log on this morning. Um, what is the typical time period it takes to close a cash flow loan request? Sure, so generally I'm say seven to eight weeks is the typical time period. And the only reason I say even um, that long is because just dealing with the time period for an appraisal and sometimes depending where the property is located, especially like it's in Hamptons, it uh, takes a little bit longer. Um, but actually I would say it would be less than that. I would say maybe like 45 days, which is, you know, around six weeks or so. So I would say, yeah, around 45 days ballpark, assuming nothing crazy popped up, but just say if it was something in the Hamptons and how the market is in the Hamptons, it's just on fire, it might add another week or two. But as far as the paperwork, you know, it's a no documentation alone. So that's not an issue. It's really just getting the appraisal back that kind of takes time and then going through the actual closing process, title review and things of that nature. Great, thanks, Charles. Um, from the same broker again in Queens, Astoria, Queens, uh, what is the typical time period again that it takes to close a commercial loan request? Sure. So commercial is always going to be longer than residential. So you might say eight weeks ballpark, maybe nine. And that's just assuming uh, that nothing pops up. Because like I mentioned, on uh, commercial transactions, there's so many different moving pieces. It could be environmental issue, title issue, um, various things that pop up, or even just, you know, things we have to consider much more because you have so many moving parts, but I would say maybe eight to nine weeks ballpark, you know, and we do offer a rush process for the commercial side in which we will um, expedite an appraisal and the borrower would pay a little bit more for that, but then that could speed things up as well. Good. Thank you, Charles. Um, different broker out in um, Long Island, what's the ballpark rate on a two slash one arm for a cash flow program? Sure, so you're about four and um, three eighths today. So four, and, under, four and three eighths. Yeah, how it works is once the score goes below that, then the rate increases, but overall four and three eighths. Four and three eighths, okay, great. Thanks, uh, Charles. Mm -hmm. um, any exceptions to the 660 minimum credit score for the cash flow program? Sure, there is, like I mentioned overall, um, you know, we are, uh, basically we look at the bigger picture. So it's not necessarily a deal killer that it is below 660, we wanna know why, and we'll look at the leverage. And like I mentioned, leverage opens up a variety of opportunities if it doesn't meet the standard criteria with immigrant. So a lower leverage, a lower leverage deal, you know, below 660, you know, um, that's doable. Great. Um, here's another one from actually your territory in Westchester is the lending territory for the EM, EMC portfolio programs, the same for your agency programs. No, it isn't. So when the crisis started with the portfolio program, since that's basically loans we're going to keep on our books, it basically shrunk uh, somewhat to the other slide I mentioned. So dealing with the agency platform, you know, it's uh, broader as far as uh, all of New Jersey, even um, more counties in uh, Connecticut and in New York, and also, you know, Metro Boston and Southeast and Southwest Florida for the agency platform. So portfolio, since we're keeping that on the books, uh, that has been, you know, reduced, but overall agency is broader. Okay, great. Um, that concludes uh, my questions from the uh, webinar attendees that were unable to, uh, to um, come out here and, and view this uh, webinar. Um, guys, if you have any um, questions, please submit them. Um, Charles, again, next, you're coming back in February, um, uh, towards the end of February to conclude your three series. Yes. And you'll have, uh, you'll have some guests to talk about their experience with immigrant. Well, uh, we, I might have like a broker or so, but broker. what it's going to have is uh, other lenders because right now, like I mentioned, the residential market full of liquidity, the commercial market is um, 
you have difficulty with certain banks not lending, specifically just dealing with forbearance requests and things of that nature. Uh, certain banks have moved people from originations to work, workouts, forbearance requests. So what I want to do is provide you know, a broad variety of different alternative lenders that the broker community can see exactly uh, this entity might be a good fit here or there versus if a you know plain vanilla bank turns down a deal what other alternatives is out there basically for financing so it's going to be more um, individuals from other institutions maybe a broker but overall it's for the brokers to be able to have alternatives in which they might not have contacts of these institutions currently. That, that makes sense. Um, I know there are a lot of banks that do refer their deals that they can't do to immigrant. Um, so that makes sense. And we'd be definitely looking forward to that uh, webinar as well in February. Um, point too, um, because like when I have uh, deals in which don't fit my criteria, I'll refer yeah. them to other colleagues. So I probably, you know, um, spend more time referring <laughs> than might even like taking in because I like to know what other uh, banks, what they're doing. So, you know, I have a, a lot of other colleagues that either regular banks, credit unions, or, you know, REITs or insurance companies. So I'm always willing to assist a broker if it's something in which, you know, I don't have that particular program, even residential, I have like a lot of contacts on the residential side as well, too. If it doesn't fit our criteria, I always try and at least uh, give a helping hand to that particular broker where they can go and maybe make a new relationship with that lender. Or sometimes they might even know the lender, but they just didn't think about this would be a good fit. So I try and accommodate those individuals, even if it's not an immigrant deal, more than willing to spend some time helping someone get their deal closed by referring it to another institution. True, very true. Okay, Carl. Carl's asking another question. Um, hold on here. Uh, who on the commercial side should a broker reach out to for a mortgage? You're looking at him. Yep. I've, yep. Carl, Carl, we'll make sure that you have uh, Charles's um, information. I know that also Catherine at Charles, Charles's office will be submitting out all of the information on Charles to every, every attendee that did attend it today. And also the video, the video will also be coming out um, probably in two days. And Charles, if you were unable to check out Charles's first presentation, um, we'll be submitting that video as well. So um, guys, this definitely does conclude. I definitely want to make an announcement. We are going to have uh, the NYC Real Estate Expo, of course, is not live this year. It will become a virtual show. And Charles as well with some of his colleagues uh, and some other uh, companies that he does work with, a, a banker, a private lender, some rehab companies, they're all going to come together and also put out a beautiful panel at the expo. And that will be in April 7th. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that is coming in April 7th. And you'll hear Charles again, as well as Charles coming up with his final webinar uh, towards the end of uh, February. So uh, again, Charles, thanks. Thanks a lot. It was very informative. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, we look forward to seeing you in February as well as in April. Same Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care for now.